anything? Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Arts Chat, uh, the business of being an artist with co-producers of Dayton Our Sounds, the B Star and Jay Castleman. And we also have Archita, who will be moderating the talk. Thank you. So, um, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. Uh, I think my first question is to, I guess, to both of you, uh, in terms of producing work, if you could talk a little bit more about um, your backgrounds of producing and also how you came onto this project uh, specifically, and what you, because you both are co-producers, so how do you divide your roles in this project? Great question. Uh, well, we're very much partners. there's creative sides and there's also um, administrative sides. So certainly to be an executive, you know, at an executive level for producer is about making sure that there's a resource for artists to be able to create because as you probably know as an artist yourself, it's not only the time but the resource to sit down in a space and create, to have access to materials, to have access to investments. Um, this piece happens to rely a lot on really advanced projection mapping techniques, mm -hmm. sound design, um, staging design that involves, uh, it, it's, it can be very expensive mm -hmm. um, to have that access. So that was something that we were very focused on was being able to raise money and be able to raise partners. So, so what we did is we co-commissioned this piece. Mm -hmm. And to co-commission a piece is to bring commissioners from around the world. So we're here in Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. but there are co-commissioners in Virginia, in uh, we have New Haven, Connecticut, and Atlanta, Georgia, and am I forgetting any? I think I am. Yeah, University of Illinois. And the Cryer Center, University of Illinois. So we brought in these, many of which are academic partners as well. And and Ovation, which is Kaki's guitar company. She yeah. plays an Ovation guitar, and she's always played Ovation, and so she has a long-term partnership with them, so they've also signed on as a commissioning partner. And, and essentially, so Greg and I play two other roles in Khaki's life, and that kind of helps define how we sh split our roles, because I am, a, 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 I am Khaki's manager also, so I manage all of her business, and um, both um, logistically, financially, everything, you know, which I just sort of, it's my job to kind of keep her career and business on track yeah. and help her execute it. Um, and then Greg's role is is her booking agent, which is the person who gets her the performances, books the performances for her. Mm -hmm. So we got when we started working together, and we realized we were going to do a new show together. We said, okay, she's doing something more than she usually does. Usually she's a musician, mm -hmm. but in this this has been an experience for all of us, a new experience for all three of us to to, to bring her into the theater. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you know we came, we decided to to sort of sign on as co-producers. And Greg's uh, played a very big role in um, raising money, financial support, and finding the right artistic partners because he already had these relationships in the theater world. Yeah. And then my job has been more logistical and also, um, I also own a marketing agency, so we will be very involved in the marketing of the project. So we have these roles already with Kathy. And right. so we have that, those hats. But in this experience, we also had a new hat. And that <laughs> hat was chaired. So we would <laughs> yeah. kind of pass it back and yeah. forth between each other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so for Vicky, um, I mean, you, you, you've managed Kaki's work for a long time now. And I'm just curious to know, um, in terms of with every new project, when you bring new people on, uh, how sort of, how, how does, so Kaki's artistic, I guess, pretty much her career depends on you, uh, in some sense, so what, what is it communication like? Do you um, have access to all of her resources? At what point uh, do you sort of step in and step out in your role as her manager, but also co-producer for this show? 
In the context of this show specifically? Yes. Well, <laughs> that's an interesting question. It's a complicated question. Um, part of my job as her manager is to make sure that she's, you know, constantly able to do her art and support it in doing her art and achieving the goals, right? Um, and then the other much more practical uh, issue is that she can survive <laughs> and pay her rent. And the reason I bring that up as an example is that to produce a show like Data Not Found, she needed to spend a lot of time not doing other things. Yeah. And we've been building a show for about a year and a half. And so, you know, we, we were able to raise some money to develop the show from partners, but that all, but then I also had to be thinking about what else can she be doing to keep busy, to keep herself in the public eye so that people don't forget who she is, mm -hmm. and to also generate, you know, a living. Mm -hmm. And so part of that is also kind of, you know, making sure we, we allocate her time so that she's got enough time to work on the show, but then still has time to go do some con regular concerts that she does or mm -hmm. record some new music to make a new album. And, you know, she also writes music for advertising sometimes and that kind of stuff. So just helping her balance everything mm -hmm. and helping her figure out when something should be prioritized and how to fit everything in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Okay. <laughs> uh, in terms of, so, this is, I guess, for both of you, in terms of the music industry, um, ever since you started, there's been a lot of, I'm sure there's been a lot of changes uh, in terms of what is considered to be music in this region, also in New York. Uh, and so I'm just curious to know what kind of audience do you expect here? Um, what kind of audience was this piece built for, if there was a target audience at all? Um, and uh, how do you see this work being positioned in this community? So in the NYU Radio Art Center, but also in the UAE and the Middle East. Great questions. you want to start? Sure. Uh, so first of all, so my name is, as you know, my name is Greg Castleman, and I founded Unbound Artists just about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. So I actually am coming into this uh, recently, but from a previous position. So in the last year and a half, I've built uh, a platform which is doing what I've been doing for about a decade, which is booking artists. Yeah. And being a booking agent is similar to being a manager, but a little bit more focused on uh, booking gigs or finding mm -hmm. live experiences. Mm -hmm. Whereas a manager's role, as Vicky's been saying, is a lot about steering a career and overseeing the business and overseeing mm -hmm. the artist's growth. Yeah. Um, but recently, I've started to also manage artists and produce work, as in this case, we're co-producers. Mm -hmm. um, I think even in the 10 years that I've been in this business, to answer your question about what is changing in the music industry, mm -hmm. it is clear that as there, first of all, there's less actual physical sales of records. Mm -hmm. We know that. We know all about the way in which music is being streamed and digitized. So there is even more pressure, mm -hmm. I would say, to some degree, a positive yeah. pressure yeah. on a booking agent. Yeah. Because if, a, if, a, if an artist's career, if their, if their income depends on all of their work and there's less and less support from their recorded music then you go to a next logical place which is performances mm -hmm. so a booking agent's role in that sense is really important to make sure that there's um, opportunities for the artist but mm -hmm. then in terms of the audience that's a great question you you bring into this which is yeah. how does our work relate to the final audience yeah. which is the viewers who get to see a piece of, of, of a, you know, a performance mm -hmm. which i think we think a lot about too because we know that even behind the scenes, mm -hmm. our work is going to have an effect on the people who get to see the show. Yeah. So here at NYU uh, Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. I think we, we worked a lot with um, the administrative staff here, the curatorial staff. We worked with Bill Reagan, mm -hmm. we worked with Lindsay Boswick, we worked, worked with uh, uh, Layla and mm -hmm. Lana, a lot of different folks. Mm -hmm. um, and we worked with them to talk about the academic environment here. Mm -hmm. What are the classes that relate with Kathy's work? Mm -hmm. What are the issues here in this, in this city and in this country that relate? Mm -hmm. And I think Data Not Found has a lot to do with this broad category called digital humanities. Yeah. And we are all living in this world. We have this infinite resource in our pocket called a, a cell phone yeah. that's connected with the internet. And how that is changing our world at a yeah. rapid pace mm -hmm. is something that artists can actually be talking about, which is something that I think is new. Yeah. I think it's a new frontier for artists to be a part of this conversation about 
what is the effect of a world that's rapidly being changed and altered and maneuvered? Yeah. Another problem, question, yeah. how are we being maneuvered yeah. by these digital forces and how do we regain our power and control? So I think that that's a lot of how our roles yeah. combine to, to affect, first of all, the audience that, we're, that, that is there for Kathy. But I think, mm -hmm. just to go back a second, I would say uh, an audience for Kathy's work is always her fans. Mm -hmm. And I think for any artist that's mm -hmm. creating work, they're, not, you're, they're usually not creating work for their fans, yeah. if that makes sense. They're not usually thinking, hmm, are my fans gonna like this or not? I need to some degree. I think they're trying to be their authentic selves. Yeah. And I think that's why their fans come to them. Mm -hmm. It's that authenticity that, that's the engine that drives the relationship that an artist has with their fans. And so I think that that's, of course, gonna be an audience for Data Not Found or, or Kathy King fans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll give you a little, tell you just a little quick anecdote to sort of underscore the, how the music business has changed. Kaki has released, I think, nine albums now. The first seven were very standard music, you know, music uh, structure and process. So she would record an album, we release, she would release it and then tour. Her show before this one, which was called The Neck is a Bridge to the Body, was, um, we actually turned that upside down. The record became the artifact from the show. So the show was the primary thing. And then she would sell the album afterwards as like a souvenir. Um, now we did of course still release the record, people still bought the album, you know, it's streaming on Spotify and everywhere else and, and it still stands as a commercial release of a recorded collection of music. Mm -hmm. But it really is the marketing tool for the show. Mm -hmm. And in the music industry, actually that is kind of what records have become now. The records have become the way to, to first reach the fan and market the artist, but that's usually not the end game anymore because nobody's making money selling records anymore. So the recording does become a bit of a marketing thing. Mm -hmm. And with this show, we're already touring it. We haven't even recorded the music yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we will, and in January, we're gonna go into the studio and record all the music and we will put an album out that's related to the show. But Kaki and I, even before we met Greg, we made a, and actually the reason we met Greg, this is interesting, mm -hmm. is I realized that Kaki's and also, she's doing instrumental guitar work. It's not pop music. Mm -hmm. And so we decided back in 2014 or 2015, I said, you know what? Let's explore the idea of getting going outside of the pop music world. Mm -hmm. And I called my old friend, Bill Bragan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, listen, I got to pick your brain. Because I've known Bill for years, and I knew him through the music scene. But he so, does so much more than that. And I said, I, I want, how do I get Khaki more into your world? Mm -hmm. I think I need a different kind of booking agent. I think I need a booking agent that's not just booking her into bars and nightclubs, but who can actually take us into the contemporary arts world. And he recommended that I call Greg. So that's actually how we met. Right. And so the, the idea there is that we literally decided to change our business model <coughs> because the pop music industry is broken in, in a lot of ways. Everybody still loves music and everybody still consumes music, but the business models are a little bit broken and need to be, you know, we have to constantly yeah. tweak how we're doing things. And so after talking with Greg, we realized that there's a, a way to reach different audiences yeah. simply by performing in different circuits and different venues and different arenas and different contexts. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing that Greg has really helped us develop and learn is how to how to look at the artist and, and take an artist like Kaki and say, okay, yes, you're, you're, you're great playing guitar, mm -hmm. but let's look at you as a holistic artist and what are all the different ways in which people might want to experience you. Yeah. And this comes into play a lot with the different kinds of places that will bring old book Kaki into the festivals, mm -hmm. um, music clubs, and performing arts centers. Those are three examples of different, very different places where she'll play. And oftentimes in musical concert venues, they're all her fans who've known her for 15 years, who have her records. And that's the model, right, in, in the mm -hmm. world of, of concert venues. Mm -hmm. The model is the promoters book a show and they make money off of ticket sales. Yeah. And it's a business. 
Um, then you have festivals, which are about getting people to buy into a festival, mm -hmm. and then hopefully explore things that they may not have known. Some of them they'll know. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe other artists in the lineup they won't know. Mm -hmm. And in the Performing Arts Center model, you kind of have elements of both, mm -hmm. but it, they're oftentimes driven by institutions that have goals. And then they have a vision for the kinds of experiences that they're bringing to a community. So here at this center and other performing arts centers, there may be fans of Kathy King's that are coming because they're excited about Kathy King. But there may be many others who are excited about the vision that the center is building or because they've been to previous performances that move them or, or help mm -hmm. them grow as an audience member. Right. Yeah. That's so interesting because, I mean, this idea of art is business, like the business industry and education, um, I guess to some extent, it's very hard to negotiate that space when, um, as you just mentioned, Vicky, um, this idea of like artists have to survive also. Right. Um, but then <clears throat> I think with the NYUD Art Center, as a student myself, and I'm a senior now, but in the four years that I've been here, it's shaped a lot of how I consume art and what kind of art I've seen. A lot of times there are artists I've never heard about, and then I see their work and I'm hooked onto them, and I have been hooked onto them. Uh, since my freshman year, which is three years ago now. Um, but it always asks this question of how do we bring these artists into, like as part of education, you know, because as a theater student, we're exposed to so much music and so much dance just through the art center mm -hmm. that it almost feels like that institution is like this life or the organism which brings in artists like Kathy mm -hmm. and artists uh, who are also navigating that space between music and, yeah. and theater and, and installation and projection. Um, in, in ter for you, Greg, uh, I had this question because I, uh, you were the booking agent for Kid Koala, mm -hmm. uh, who also performed here two, two, two years ago, I think, now, two years ago, yeah, or maybe three, I'm not sure. And he's coming back. And he's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just casual hype about it. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. What was it like working on that process? I don't want to say versus this process, but then um, the role of a booking agent in two sure. different processes. Could you explain that? Sure. Actually, there's some great parallels with Kid Koala and this piece. I should preface this by saying that I left the agency that I was with that was working with Kid Koala at the time. Right. Yeah. So I actually don't represent Kid Koala anymore. Yeah. But at the time that I was with that previous agency, I, uh, I booked Kid Koala's new phone must fall, and I think over 40 cities around the world. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it was something where I was coming in after it had been produced, mm -hmm. after it had debuted, yeah. and it was about matching the show that had been created with audiences around the world that wanted them to want to see it. Mm -hmm. And Kid Koala is a musician like Kathy King that has a career that goes back to various different kinds of musical projects. But he is yeah. a hip hop turntablist. Mm -hmm. like that was his training ground. Yeah. But I think as his career grew, mm -hmm. and also because he had so many other interests other than just spinning, mm -hmm. he, he got into this world of performance. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some different reasons also why some artists start out young and they're like in, in the clubs yeah. and the scenes and as they have like an older, they have families. Yeah. It's nice to be able to have that adversity to sit down. Because yeah. the touring life, mm -hmm. I should add, is, can be really rigorous. Yeah. I mean, imagine some tours that artists do and they're in, 30 cities in a month. Yeah. I mean, that happens sometimes. And it's mm -hmm. just like, you know, you get in a bus and you wake up at 6 a.m. And, and it's grueling. Yeah. Um, but it's also really fun, I think, some would say. Mm -hmm. But with Kid Koala, um, he was not only, he's, he's a turntablist, mm -hmm. but he's also a graphic novelist. Mm -hmm. He's a composer. Uh, so he has been combining all of those talents into creating these really unique shows. Yeah. And um, Kathy King is similar in the sense that she comes from that world mm -hmm. of being a musician, but yeah. having various interests in, she has this interest in visual work. Yeah. She has this interest in projection mapping. Mm -hmm. She has this interest in her guitar, mm -hmm. not just being a instrument of music, mm -hmm. but being a communicator. So actually mm -hmm. that was the inspiration of the title of the last piece, The Neck is the Bridge to the Body. It was saying, mm -hmm. it was a, it was a um, the neck is obviously, right, our, yeah. our human neck, but the neck of the guitar yeah. has these similar obviously the analogs. Yeah. So the question is, as a guitarist, can Kaki push the boundaries beyond the guitar just being an instrument, but being a communicator, being a, a, a vessel of ideas? So that's really one of the ideas that pushed her. And yeah. so unlike Kid Koala's show, 
Mm -hmm. that was already created by the time I was booking it, mm -hmm. I actually got to wear a creative producer's hat. Mm -hmm. And we got to help to, to bring Tacky into different modes of creation. We got to help shape, and, and she would come to us, we would come to her. Yeah. It was a very, very collaborative process. Other people would come to us too. People asked to be part of the project. Mm -hmm. So that was a really different experience to be on the front end. And now that the show is ready to tour, yeah. we're going to put back that hat of the of the agent and the manager yeah. and bring it to, uh, you know, all around the world. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, I have one more question for both of you. And this is for, um, so as, as an emerging artist, I guess, uh, could you talk a little bit about self-producing work? What does that look like? especially uh, for artists who are still kind of up and coming. Um, what are some tips you might have about self-producing? Uh, I guess, I mean, I, I, we have been talking a lot about producing for, producing in the arts, and also the arts is this very interdisciplinary thing, which is great because a lot of times it's not just music and theater and dance or, and performance as a whole, right? Um, but then, could you talk about what your experience has been uh, working as producers, but also, I guess, what would you say to an artist who is someone like who is freelancing and who's still kind of struggling between like the creative side of like, like the making part of it, but also the selling and marketing? Mm. That are you talking about an artist who doesn't have a booking agent or yes. manager or yeah. that stuff? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the only advice I have is you better believe in yourself, <laughs> a thousand percent. I mean, I marvel every day with all my artists and, and all artists how, how bruising it must be on your ego to have to constantly be putting yourself out there to be critiqued and reviewed and, you know, either you're, you're trying to get a gig and they don't want to book you or whatever, you know, it's hard. It's really hard. And you really... Uh, it takes an enormous amount of hustle. It takes, I think most successful artists nowadays are, I mean, first of all, social media is a job in and of itself, mm -hmm. and you can't really be a successful artist these days if you're not doing your social media well, yeah. um, and really engaging with an audience, and that's usually where your fan base starts. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see now, you know, I have a, so I have a marketing agency and we get a lot of calls. Every, every, every day we get a call or an email or from someone who wants us to do their PR. Mm -hmm. um, and my, I don't run our PR division, I run our, our management division, but my business partner who runs our PR division, I know, I hear her on the phone all the time, and we cannot even take on a project mm -hmm. if the project doesn't have a certain level of fan base already. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because when we pitch the artist then to the magazines to write stories about the artist, the magazine editors are going to do the same thing. They're going to look and see if the artist has any sort of following. The, the data that's out there, coming back to data, mm -hmm. the theme of our show, um, the data that's out there is, is, is there are serious pros and serious cons to it because now everybody can kind of evaluate your success. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So... I think, you know, really the question is, and unfortunately less and less people have, have there, are, there are less people being daring now about mm -hmm. the arts. People just want to, especially if they're in it for the money, and if the business model is how can we make the most money, mm -hmm. which I'm not, you know, obviously that's a thing, everybody needs to make a living, but, you know, people want to, they don't want to sign a band because it's a great music, they want to sign a band because they've got big numbers, mm -hmm. which, is kind of deflating to think about from an artistic standpoint. But that's not to say there aren't people out there who really truly believe in the arts. It's just that you have to really be, you know, you have to persevere and you have to really be dedicated to what you're trying to do mm -hmm. and find the people. This is this goes back to the thing with Khaki. You know, mm -hmm. I, I said it was like, okay, first of all, Khaki added this um, visual element, the projection mapping. Mm -hmm. you, you guys will see some of it at her show, but it was even her last show had a little had had the projection mapping. It wasn't as elaborate, it wasn't full on theater. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was a concert, but she also did have a whole visual element. And it was very hard to sell that into nightclubs. Mm -hmm. So that was part of why we changed our business model. Similarly, it's very hard to convince a record label to sign an instrumental guitarist. Mm -hmm. So we, we said, okay, we're just gonna do it ourselves. So we put out 
the last three or four records ourselves. Mm -hmm. no, well, last three, I'd say, ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, but you really just have to constantly, it's, you have to treat it like a job. You know, I mean, you have to work 40, 50 hours a week. You have to wake up every morning thinking about what you're going to do to further your career and just believe in yourself and keep trying to put yourself in front of audiences and presenters and people that you can win them over. Sometimes it's one by one. Yeah. I mean, everything Vicky said, I would say. And I, I think touch, touching on two of the points she just brought up in terms of uh, fans, mm -hmm. also in terms of just like the ego and the, the feeling behind it all. Mm -hmm. Like Vicky, I get probably anywhere between three to five artists a week you know, messaging me saying, hey, would you represent me as a, in a, as a booking agent or whatever they may be looking for. And I always respond to every single one. As long as they, as long as it's not something that's, I mean, dear sir, <laughs> or they're kind of in mass writing to a bunch of agents, and if they haven't done their homework, like you know, do your homework. Mm -hmm. I would tell any artist if, as you're starting out, do your homework. Find out who are the artists that you look up to. What are the careers that they have, and and, and kind of research. And, and when you reach out to somebody, show that you're interested in them. Mm -hmm. Show that you care about the work that they do, because I think. The number one way to win my heart, and I'll just speak for myself, is if somebody reaches out and says, I really like something about what you've done. And I go, thanks for, for checking that out. Let me let me give back now. Right? So I think that's a really important way for artists to be approaching things. But I would, in terms of ego and in terms of, well, not, I don't think ego is the right word, but just in terms of the vulnerability mm -hmm. in putting yourself as an artist out there for constant critique and for constant, you know, it's, it's, it's got to, it's, I know it's tough. Um, I think Vicky and I are both creative people, but we're, I will speak for myself. I'm not an active artist, mm -hmm. so I have to constantly be putting myself into the shoes of, that, of, a, of, a, of an artist to really understand their experience. Yeah. But I would say is um, your audience, your fans, is the currency that moves everything. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be, if you want to be living in an environment where people take risks on you. If you want to be daring as an artist, make sure there's an audience already there. And, and that's something that I think a lot of artists forget, at, at least at the baby stage. Mm -hmm. They're thinking about all the different things and they may not be thinking about who is their audience? Who are they speaking to? Mm -hmm. what, um, where do they live? Uh, what do they look like? What do they care about? Yeah. Um, and sometimes your artists, your, sometimes your audience starts with 10 people in someone's basement. Absolutely. And that 10 people is so important and so valuable. I mean, there's there's no show that's too small when you're first starting out. If, you know, if you have five or ten people in the room and you win them over, the next time they'll each bring a friend, and then you have twenty people in the room. And then, Especially in environments like NYUAD or, or any, you know, they're in the practice room, they're in the studio, they're 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 working on their craft, yeah. right? Yeah. And so that question about audience is something that necessarily organically comes up. Yeah. Um, but I think it comes from a place of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons that a lot of artists don't start thinking about audience right away is the anxiety of like, are people going to like me? Yeah. You know, is my work going to be appreciated? So I think owning up to that vulnerability mm -hmm. and saying, you know what, that's that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all right to be vulnerable. It's okay to not be rejected. In fact, as a booking agent, mm -hmm. um, rejection is my favorite thing. <laughs> no, seriously, Why? I love rejection. Because I don't have to waste my time. So if somebody is that I'm working at the theater or uh, and they say, no, I'll pass. I'm like, great. Because now I'm going to find somebody else and not waste my time trying to spin my wheels with somebody that isn't interested in working mm -hmm. with the artist that I'm working with or with me. So I think with an artist, the same thing. If you are pitching yourself in some way and you get rejected, excellent. Because mm -hmm. then you can get on to the next best person, the next best. And I think that's one way that I hope artists, that, what I would say to an artist, so that they can get over that hump. Yeah. And say, all right, let's let's start thinking about. Because if you have fans, mm -hmm. if you have an audience, if you have people that care about you, everything else is going to fall into place. Everything else. I get it. Yeah, very reassuring to you. Um. <laughs> and literally, I mean, you know, he, I I was just speaking on a panel a couple weeks ago at a university um, in in New York, and you know, it's it's always the question when you're starting out is like, how do we how do we get that first thing happening? How do we get, you know? And it's it's literally like find an empty room. If you're a musician, you know, 
ask the, your local bar or somebody borrow someone's spare room and bring in some sound system and invite 20 or 30 friends and invite the local newspaper. You know, and sometimes you have to do that quite a few times before the local newspaper might show up. But it really does. You have to start local, start in your own community, and build a community around what you do, which also means networking with other artists who do what you do, especially if they're in your locale. Mm -hmm. Put show, get together with some other artists and do a show with a bunch of artists, and they all bring their friends. You know, that kind of stuff. It's super important. Mm -hmm. I mean, even you look at like the probably the biggest genre of music these days is hip hop, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, little, un I mean, hip hop artists come out of nowhere every day. They, mm -hmm. All of a sudden you just, they, they were nowhere and now they're on Drake's album. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. community. Yeah. That's community. That's people yeah. giving, that's people who In that culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in that culture, that's people saying, hey, come on, I like what you're doing. I'm gonna give you a, an opportunity to come sing on my record or whatever, you know, but it's really about getting out there and networking. Mm -hmm. And you asked also about self-producing. Mm -hmm. I forgot to respond to that. Um, there, is, there are actually quite a few platforms that are, that are great mm -hmm. for artists that, that have an audience or, or are building an audience. Mm -hmm. um, Indiegogo, um, mm -hmm. uh, Patreon, um, there is uh, Kickstarter. So those are all ways that an artist can self-produce. Mm -hmm. And they have, each of those different platforms has a different pro and con. But if you have an, a really good idea and you want to get buy-in and you mm -hmm. aren't yet at that stage where you can do something like Kathy King is doing here, yeah. I think there are actually quite a few digital tools now that are helpful in that self-producing process. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to open it up. Mm -hmm. People might have questions, comments. Yes. I can... It's a question for you both. I'm just really interested in, in, in your background. What have you like studied in school and how did, was it like from the beginning your plan going into this industry? If not, how you did, did you get into it? A yeah. <laughs> As a student, I'm really interested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, 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 we have very different stories. I studied uh, international relations with a minor in nuclear policy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> And I had big dreams of working in some, some think tank in Washington, D.C. Um, so here I am. <laughs> Internationally. Really. Internationally. I just had a huge passion for music. And this is just totally random. I moved to New York. I didn't know anyone except my boyfriend at the time. Actually, guitarist as well? I mean, I played guitar yeah, as a so kid, but I, I was hugely passionate about music. And when I worked to New York, when I moved to New York, I needed to find a way to meet people besides going to bars. And I volunteered to, I was like interning at a local radio station, and the next thing I knew, I had my own music show on the radio. Wow. <laughs> so, and the rest, you know, that, that was my first step in the music business. Thank you. Uh, like Vicki, I studied something completely different than what I'm doing now. I uh, majored in psychology with minor concentrations in cognitive science and child development. <laughs> Artists in some ways are like children. <laughs> There's a lot of psychology. Uh, but honestly, I, I, I was also really passionate about music from the earliest age. And in college, I sang in every single a cappella group and every single... I did every, just probably experiences like you guys have here where you just mm -hmm. try to soak it all up. But I think I never got the message. This was, I think, from coming. Sorry, folks. Um, my parents I'm speaking to. Uh, <laughs> I didn't get the message that it was okay to, to pursue the arts as a profession. Um, I didn't really get this sense from my college about what the track was, and that was something that I wish I had. Mm -hmm. So if you're a student, you're watching this, I think if you want that career in the arts, go for it. I hope you work go for it. Um, but I don't think that I had that understanding, so it wasn't until after I graduated where I just found my way back to my passion. And I think that is something that hopefully everybody gets so enriching mm -hmm. to be doing something as your vocation, that's your passion. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think, obviously, if it were about money, I think both of us would be doing something different. Mm -hmm. with our, you know, it's like that was our goal, to make lots of money. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that is for some people, and that's fine. But if, you live in, if you're living a life with passion, I think it's the best life. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. What are you studying? I'm studying social research and public policy. There you go. That's a perfect track. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. We're both taking summer interns. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Amazing, yeah. Not I'm, quite, not quite with nuclear policy, but like, yeah, that's fine. And do you think you want to pursue that? I'm really interested. So I'm really interested in uh, social media and public policy and how social media right now like affects the. Um, kind of like the world we live in, as you said, with like both industries and like music and policies as well. And I'm also taking like data analysis class now. So my professor is actually super passionate about the this, this show and he's bringing all the students to see it. So we're excited. Mm, yes. uh, but yeah, I still haven't found like what, what, what is my exact, but for now, like to interest is the things that I'm studying and the things that I'm doing like outside school is this internship in Art Center. Yeah. So it's very, it's very inspiring to hear stories like yours. <laughs> Mm -hmm. like, yeah. yeah, and you guys all know that nobody, nobody does when they're forty-five years old what they were doing when they're twenty-five years old, right? Nobody does. That <laughs> Very few people. I mean, it used to be you would have a career your whole life. I don't know anybody my age who's doing now what they did twenty years ago. It doesn't happen mm -hmm. anymore. So, mm -hmm. just be open-minded, follow your passion, go where it's calling mm -hmm. you. So, you know, yeah. and work hard. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> ask, ask lots of questions. I, like in the setting, and then, because I think uh, when I was in my early 20s, I don't know if you can relate, I think mm -hmm. I felt like I knew everything. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> no, I didn't know that much. Um, so just, you know, mm -hmm. be curious your whole life and you will succeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'd like to start with a statement and then maybe just two questions, that's okay. So, First thing, uh, as a person who is much like uh, Kathy was saying, uh, I'm, a, I'm a very multidisciplinary, multi I wear many hats, and that has been a great, that has been both an advantage and a disadvantage to my ego, let's say. <laughs> and uh, there was this one statement that I heard straight from David Man Mamet, which uh, very big writer in the United States, and he said, I love my fans, they pay for my rent. And that's when it clicked, is that for me personally, I felt that I was overshooting uh, my target. I'm not really, I was perhaps aiming for something bigger than what I really, really should be focusing on. So I suppose the first question is, is it possible that the independent artists, when they begin, that perhaps they are overshooting? Uh, for you know the big million dollar prize or the huge sensationalism and whatnot. Is uh, and second question is, given that today we are in a uh, time where pretty much everyone can uh, are being encouraged to be their own accountants, their own financial planners, their own Google analytic experts, has this been adding any pressure to what a booking agent does? Wow, so really big questions, like good questions. Um, thank you for asking them. Um, do you want to go first? I can answer the first question. I don't know so much about the second. Well, I can answer both. The, the first question is, I don't. I disagree with David. <laughs> okay. I mean, I think when you're a new artist starting out, how would you even know where you want to be in twenty years? Right. Like you can't. I think you should be. You should be as ambitious as you want to be. And figure out what you're good at and give it your best shot. Yeah, right. You don't want to start out hesitant or tentative about it. You want to give it your best shot, shot from day one, but you have to keep giving it your best shot all along. Right. I don't know what the over, overreaching part it would be. Yeah. Unless you're trying to be something that you're not. So, for example, I want to get a, I don't know, $50,000 on my first gift, whatever. Let's do the oh, you mean your expectations were too high? Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, you got to be humble. I mean, you have to have a big ego, but you also have to be happy if only 10 people come. <laughs> Basically, you have, you, have to have, you have two feet, right? One's got to be planted in realism, and another has got to be planted in aspiration. And realism is, is, there is a world of constraints. There are things that happen, and there are things that don't. And those things that happen and don't change over time. So what happens today is not happening in a week, you know, so there's the constraints move, but you have to realize there are, there, are, there are rules, there are ways the world works. But in the other foot, you're in, the, you're in aspiration mode. What's my big dream? What do I really want for myself? I think if you make those big goals and dreams about like money or fame, I, I don't feel like they're goals that 
how can you ever be satisfied? I don't think you can be an artist. I mean, what is if your the goal what is the number of money that will make you achieve the goal? What is the number of it's like those are things that are that are byproducts, I guess, of, of being an artist. I, I don't think that I don't think most artists, maybe some, I think there are some that have that as the goal. But um, I think most artists are in it because they really love what they do and they and they want to share that with other people. Right. So I think if you have that as an artist yourself, it's in multi. And I think part of your question was about the fact that being multidisciplinary is both an advantage and a disadvantage. Yeah. Um, how do you feel it's a disadvantage? Uh, in a sense, uh, I think it's an egoic thing because, for example, like, uh, let's say uh, I'm involved in filming, that's where I make, make most of my living. Uh, as I'm shooting and I'm editing and whatnot, I'm like, man, I could be writing right now. I have this, I have this one great idea for a book and whatnot. But that would mean that I'd have to start over and blah, blah, blah. And so, Essentially, the fear of diverting from what's already, you know, keeping you standing on your own two legs, uh, but at the same time, you just kind of mourn for you. What, what else? You, you know, you only have so so little. You only you only have so much time, and let's face it, uh, mortality is the, is, is going to be your eternal obstacle. So. Uh, it's just a question of, is there, a, a, for, for me it's always a question, of, am I ever going to have to, am I ever going to balance between both? Because I'd love to write as much as I'd love to film. Yeah. I, 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 I suspect that any innovator, whether it was Isaac Newton or Steve Jobs or um, Madonna <laughs> or, you know, anyone, Meg Whitman, I mean anyone, you, are, you're, you have a living but in the back of your mind, there's something bigger that you want to do, that you want to achieve. And I think if that's the case, if you feel the innovator's quest is you have a, a, a goal, you have a, a hypothesis, you have a theory, you have an, uh, something that you really want to achieve, I think everybody has to be doing something else before they can really go out there and make something new. So, so I guess give, be easy on, uh, be kind to yourself, you know, don't, um, I think a lot of artists are hard on themselves. So be, be kind to yourself and say, you know what, it's okay that I have this thing going on right now that may not be where I want to end up. And in order to get where I want to end up, all I have to do is do. I just have to be actively involved in what I want to go and, and, and get. As long as you're getting to do that, and you put in the time, the passion, I think you get to go places. Maybe not the unrealistic places if, if you have unrealistic goals, but then I would also say, like, what is an unrealistic goal? Right. You know, I think any goal is worthy as long as you really believe in it. Mm -hmm. And the booking agent, you, you know, the challenge on a booking agent. Oh, yeah, so you're, is that for me or for the artist that I work with, or both? Uh, yeah, I think both the teams. best, the, the, the most successful artist collaborations that I have are with artists that are uh, interested in their business, interested in their accounting, interested in their marketing, interested in their fan, like the, those are really successful collaborations because then I'm a partner with the artist. Right. I'm not having to shepherd them, I'm not having to teach them. Right. That has to happen usually, but um, I think more and more in the 21st century, we all have to be um, Jackson Janes of all, of all traits. Right. And that's something that's important for any artist or any agent. I don't know if you feel the same way. Yeah, I, I, as an artist manager, I feel like every artist should learn, should, should do for themselves every aspect of the job that I do before they hire me to do it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, how do they know if I'm doing a good job or not? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to know what it means to go book a show for yourself. Right. You need to know what it means to do your accounting. You need to know what it means to try to market and promote yourself. And then you can hire someone else to do those things for you once you get to a level where you're making enough money to do it. But if you don't even, if you're, if you're hiring someone to do something that you don't know what it's supposed to be, you don't want to give me your money, right. so. And I do think it's. I see. I I see myself as a business partner with the people I manage. I'm not. I'm not the boss. I'm not the parent. I'm not the. You know, we're business partners. So they have to understand. We both have to understand what we're doing. I'm also curious. Um, what are your professional or personal goals that you want to achieve? Hmm. <laughs> well, I've been doing this a while, <laughs> so 
my goal is to retire in 10 years. <laughs> um, I'm actually, I've, I've, I'm constantly having new goals and also sometimes find, accidentally falling into fun new things. I mean, I've only been, I've been in the music business 25 years, but I've only been managing artists for eight. And I've only been working in theater for two. <laughs> I mean, I'm now a theater producer. I've never done this before. You know, so, but that, it wasn't so much I had a goal of being a theater producer. It was more that I was in a situation where we were brainstorming about what should we do. And over time, this stuff developed. So, yeah, so I've, I'm, I'm less about having goals and more about being open to what the world brings to me. And that's sort of, for better or worse, how I've always operated, I guess. I'm in a, a bit, bit of a different stage of career where I think retirement is like 30 <laughs> some odd years. You just started, you just started Yeah, I mean, I've been doing this for 10 years. My company's 25 years old. Yeah, different, different stages. Um, uh, but it's interesting because the question you're asking me is like put my goals on record because when this is being recorded, so there's a little bit of pressure I'm feeling in answering this question. But, because um, then you want to be accountable to your goals, I think. But I would say, Number one career goal that I have is to um, uh, help artists realize their dreams. Um, to really be a partner with artists and the artists that I get to work with, I wanna make sure that, that was actually the inspiration for the company that I founded. It's called Unbound Artists. And I want this sense of movement that I can unleash what's capable by being a partner, by being a good listener, by being a producer, an agent, a manager, what, at various points a publicist. Um, that's a, a major goal that I have. Another major goal that I have is I want to have that experience one time in my career where I got to break an artist, um, where they were unknown, and then they get to that level of being known. I think that's something that's not a science, it's a, it's a labor of love and passion. And then a third goal that I have is, um, uh, I think in the 21st century, the role of arts representatives is going to have to change, just like all the other roles that are constantly changing. And so I really want to be involved in content creation. Um, Artists are obviously creating content. Um, I think my role in the future is gonna have to be in creating content, whether that's in uh, blog, or whether that's in writing, or whether that's in books, or I'm not sure exactly, but I think I'm gonna have to be involved in content creation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. This might seem like a random question, but it's something that I've been thinking about, and knowing that that I'm not found is such a kind of research-focused um, project that often had elements to it that you went down and said, okay, this isn't working, let's shift. I'm wondering um, what you think the relationship between art and research is. Well, that's interesting. I just read Manhattan Beach, Jennifer Egan, do you know mm -hmm. the author? Um, and she's got like 10 pages in the back of it. It's a, it's a fiction, piece of fiction, but she's got 10 pages of credits because she it's a story of a woman who um, becomes an adult in the United States during World War II and is working in the Navy Yards. But it's just got so much detail in it. And I really think it has it's really about the piece, right? Although, no, now I'm thinking of an, another um, article I just read of, that Alex Chi wrote about, he's a no, novelist, Asian American novelist, um, about how he was, th there was a debate about when you're writing about some, a, a character that you have never met. Like, like if I was writing about a story of a young black boy, for example, and there's a big debate right now about what, you know, should I even be writing that story? Um, so in that sense, I think, I think research is important. It, but it kind of depends on what you're writing about, and some things you just can't research because you can't. If you haven't lived it, you haven't lived it. You know, so it I think it's really story specific. I relate to that. Um, I would answer the question in terms of looking at the fact that in a lot of academic institutions, arts and sciences are something that get paired together, and the question is, if you think about it, why? I think there's a lot in common between art and science. And of course science, an integral, the scientific method is, is, is wholly linked with research. And I think both scientists and artists um, are using different methodology to address theories or hypotheses that they have. 
And I think that testing and probing is essential to being an artist and it's essential to being a researcher. Um, I think that uh, there was a curator that I was interviewing once and asking, like, what, what, how do you, what do you, or what are you drawn to in, in art? And the curator said, um, I love art that doesn't, it's, that doesn't feel like it's trying to, to say something about right now. It kind of organically is saying something that feels like it's speaking 10 years ahead from now. And that really resonated with me about what the purpose of art is and how it's expanding what we know. Um, and I think science research does the same thing where it's looking at happenings that are going on right now, but hopefully it's going to tell us something about the next 10 years or the next 100 years or something like that. So I think that is a, another way that the research, and, and as it relates to data not found, I think that this piece is gonna continue to grow. I think new research is gonna happen in performative structures. I think new research is gonna happen um, for Kathy as she explores these bounds of, of her work. So I think that the research process is also gonna be completely linked with the, the evolution of data not found. And I think for Kathy, it grounded her piece because she was able to, she, I think she started by looking at a lot of really current modern issues. And then as she started to research, she realized they were actually very universal and very human issues that you could, there were, that were sometimes metaphorical, but often very tangible historic, there were, you know, through lines through history. So it really kind of grounded her. And from there, I think it allows to, the artist to tell a more universal story. Because in the, I think one of the big roles of an artist in our society is to help us understand our world. And to understand it, not just here, but to understand it and to really kind of help us relate and commune to get together and commune about how we're feeling about stuff. Uh, I remember she, remember, maybe, I can't remember exactly when this first happened, but Kaki started researching about sand. Pretty, I think that started actually around here, the time that when she, she first came, came. Yeah, she got really excited about the sand. And I remember at the time thinking, oh, that's really interesting, but not really understanding why, you know? It's like, mm -hmm. sand is cool, though, but what, what does that have to do with data? And as she did her research, and she shared that with us, I was blown away by this, this interesting connection between the fact that sand is, you know, just the number of particles of sand in the earth and how that's this, this metaphor for data, but also the fact that sand is one of the main components in semiconductors mm -hmm. that's driving the fact that these little, little teeny semiconductors that allow for mass amounts of information on our phones. And mm -hmm. that, that research that she did has forever more influenced my understanding of sand. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that artists can, can actually bring that research to life in ways that work well. You all are gonna get to see it, I hope, <laughs> to, to see how this comes to life on stage. I find the researchers practice very interesting also because um, in our theater program we're always talking about at what point do you you know like go from your laboratory to the to the rehearsal room mm -hmm. uh, and how you build um, research methodologies that can be used in your work uh, as like vocabulary as you're saying right between uh, the artist but also everyone else who supports the artist in making the work and bringing it to life. Um, and it's very interesting because at some point, I guess, in this work, especially, the, the idea of practice and research, like the boundaries almost get blurred because what we see, because we were also talking about digital humanities and as much as I know about it, I think it's one of those fields that is trying to break um, the, the binary between what is theory and what is practice. Uh, and questions, like, can we really like start thinking about research in a more practical sense, where it's not just like being locked up in a room, but then it's more organic than, uh, like as you make work, as the artist makes work, she, he, they is, they're still kind of uh, holding on to like the newness of the work and, and exploring new things, which is just exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. So much. Thank you.